Oh, thank you, folks. Uh, and uh, no Masonic undertaking should be done without asking the uh, invocation of deity. So uh, please uh, assume a respectful posture and uh, bow your heads for prayer. Uh, great architect of the universe, the giver of all good gifts and graces, the we uh, humbly uh, ask your blessing in, in bringing us together, bringing us the Masonic light that we are uh, seeking tonight. Um, we ask that you be with us, be with the presenter, and uh, be with all Master Masons throughout the world. Uh, and uh, I'll uh, end it with that. Thank you for uh, um, all that you've done for us. Um, amen. Okay, that being the case, uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction. Um, Ryan and Michael, let's see, if you want to say a couple of quick words, say hello to everybody. These are the, the gentlemen that I've been working with for uh, coordinating these sessions. Hi, everyone. Oh, good to be with you all. Thank you. Uh, Hey, so the we'll go ahead and get started here. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Jamie, and um, we'll go from there. Jamie, thanks, Randy. Thanks, brethren. Thanks, guests and friends. I'm going to share my screen here real quick. If I could remember how to do that, share this share. You seeing what I'm seeing? Let's see. Randy? Yep, it's good. Okay. Yeah, we're out and we're looking good here. So how's that? It should be taking up the entirety of the uh, screen there for you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So again, uh, thanks for making it out to this presentation and uh, you know, sadly, we couldn't be doing this uh, at the temple or in the lodge or a library or something, but uh, we're making the best of this situation by, uh, you know, keeping our education programs going and uh, trying to spread Masonic light through virtual means. And uh, if you're a Mason and you're interested in staying abreast of Mas the current state of Masonic education, please check out Refracted Light. Uh, Joe Martinez, a brother out of Washington, well, out of uh, Virginia, the DC area, uh, and some other brethren have uh, started up that site. So do check it out. And they have a, uh, a calendar of a bunch of Masonic education events. So for your lodge, wherever you are, or if you're just interested, many of them are open to non-Masons. And uh, so do check that out. I'm gonna jump right into this presentation. This is Freemasonry and the Tarot. So as Freemasons, you probably noticed that periodically we'll run into uh, the symbolism of the tarot card cards, or we'll hear uh, someone at the lodge maybe talking about tarot, or if you go to one of the esoteric symposia, or you know you're just talking to some of the younger guys coming around maybe at your education night or your kind of dinner before you're stated, etc. You know you'll find that there's a again a growing interest in esoterica generally and. Um, but certainly tarot's been sort of an aspect of that. If you see that central card there, a lot of, you know, every Mason should be able to recognize something in there that resonates with them. So, <clears throat> so we encounter that around Freemasonry, but, you know, kind of why is that? You know, a lot of us may wonder who are not conversant with uh, the Western esoteric tradition or, you know, these things may seem occulty. We may, we may like to sort of dismiss them out of hand as superstitious playthings, you know, divinatory, sort of no better than a Ouija board. So, 
I'm hoping to dispel some of that or, you know, not necessarily dispel it. I mean, everybody should make up their own idea about how they feel um, about subjects like this. If it's something you're interested in, you know, dive in. There are a lot of things that come up in uh, Masonic education that are just not my avenue of interest. You know, this may be one for you where it's like you're into, you know, the old charges or you're into Preston or Anderson and, and you like going down those rabbit holes. Uh, I, I can definitely appreciate that. And that is terribly important, right? Of course, that we have to know our history. We have to know the, the body of our literature, you know, particularly when it's so close to what our, our uh, ritual is based on. But, you know, there are, there are certain things for certain people. You could be interested in history, architecture, uh, Western esoterica, geometry, operative stonemasonry, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of, we're going to investigate Freemasonry's relationship with the tarot and how <clears throat> sort of first a historical background, kind of whence these cards came, how they were developed. And then we're going to, you know, I'm, my argument is that I'm going to show that at every crucial juncture in the evolution of this, you know, strange, enigmatic deck of cards. At every crucial junction, a Freemason has been present, and a Freemason has uh, initiated that change. That's the, and that's been happening for um, hundreds of years. So, tarot cards uh, initially they developed from playing cards. And playing cards kind of make their way into Europe around the 14, the beginning of the 14th century is when they're, they're introduced. Uh, they probably came from various points east. Uh, sometimes you'll hear Mamluk. Sometimes you'll hear from, uh, you know, from, from China, from India, from Persia, uh, the Ottoman Empire, you know, various routes coming coming west from uh, you know along the eastern trade routes and in short order still during the 14th century to these regular playing cards which consisted of court cards like you see in this picture but also the pips that we're familiar with so the numbered cards <clears throat> and similar suits not always the same but similar suits during the 14th century, the major arcana, or the trumps, the 22 trumps were added to the playing cards. Now these are, um, the playing cards sort of made it into the, the various courts of uh, Western Europe, uh, particularly in France and Italy. And added to them, were these 22 trumps, and there was actually a game, Tarochi or Taroki. I'm not sure how it was pronounced, but uh, there was a game that was played that involved not only the four suits, their pips and court cards, like regular a regular deck of playing cards, but also these 22 um, trump cards. Now that word, uh, trump cards. Later, we ended up calling them the major arcana, which if you're familiar with tarot, that's probably the, the term that you recognize these cards under. But uh, they got their name from, from the, uh, an Italian word, triomphi. And triomphi is the a cognate of triumph they share an etymological root. And these, if you, if you keep following that back, uh, triumphi and a triumph um, kind of lead back to the victory processions. Uh, after like say sacking a city, there would be a victory procession where the, the spoils would be uh, on display in sort of a carousel. In fact, the carousel, just like our merry-go-round, is um, said to be from these uh, the same source, the victory procession. 
Uh, the earliest one I can think of is at the end of the Iliad when Troy is sacked, and uh, there's a ridiculously tiringly long uh, sequence at the end of the, the Iliad where they parade around the spoils from Troy. And that victory procession in time ends up being the triumphi or the triumph or the carousel and the trumps, which is uh, the 22 cards added to the tarot. Now, these cards in their early history in Europe were utilized in their first sort of non-recreational sense, or maybe it's, you could still say recreational, but in their first sort of mystical or uh, divinatory sense by the Romani people uh, who, who we could call gypsies, right? And the word gypsy coming from Egyptian, um, though they were not Egyptian, uh, they were, I'm not sure what their ethnicity was, they were the Romani, Rom Ro Romani, I'm not sure how you say it exactly, R-O-M-A-N-I, commonly known as gypsies, and they used the tarot cards and regular playing cards uh, for divination. Now, this is not the same sort of, this isn't where I would say occult tarot begins, or even tarot in the Western esoteric tradition begins. Uh, I'd say this is still early stages. Um, they're being introduced to the, uh, to the populace in Europe. And, you know, they might as well have been reading tea leaves or, any, you know, it was just something to use for their divination. So the first time you get occult tarot beginning properly, you see it in Le Monde Primitif, uh, The Primitive World. And that is from Court de Jebeline. This came out in 1771. Uh, sorry, 1781. But 1771 was when Court de Jebeline was initiated at uh, Lodge Les Amis uh, Renu, Reni. Lodge Les Amis Reni in France. 1771, Court de Jebeline. Uh, initiated into masonry. And he, in Le Monde Primitif, launches the first sort of excursion into occult tarot. Another person who wrote an article in this same book, wrote a, a, a certain segment of the same book, was a man named De Malay. And De Malay, also a mason, was the first uh, to attribute those 22 cards of the major arcana, those that were added to the regular deck of playing cards. He was the first to attribute those cards to um, the Hebrew alphabet, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, minus the finals. So that's something that's going to stay with tarot all the way to the present day, that association, particularly as we'll see when we venture into you know, deeper into Western esoterica and particularly what's called Hermetic Kabbalah. So, De Malay in Court de Javelin's Le Monde Primitif uh, links the tarot to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, this is the beginning of occult tarot, and this is happening in 1781 with the publication of this book. Not too long afterward, we run into Eliphas Levy, uh, who in 1861 was initiated into Lodge Rose du Parfait Silence. That's Lodge Rose du Parfait Silence. Pardon my French. Uh, that's 1861. And in 1854, however, um, Levy had written this book that you see the sort of frontispiece for there. Uh, Dogma, at rich, Dogma and Ritual in High Magic is what that says. And uh, in it, there are 22 chapters. As you would imagine, each of them are associated with a particular tarot card from the major arcana. So 
another Freemason at this point, just like De Jabalin and De Malay before him, initiating some great changes in the tarot. The, on, the only real changes, other than artistic changes that were happening, you know, stylistically among the various courts, French and Italian courts. But in terms of a theoretical perspective of using the tarot as an aspect of um, magical, astrological, and hermetic sort of thinking. So in other words, that whole milieu of subjects which uh, coalesce under the general heading of Western esoterica. You see that happening probably more with, uh, with Eliphas Levy than um, most others, just because he's he's often cited. In fact, most people will tell you that this is the first attribution of the 22 major arcana to the Hebrew alphabet. That's not the case. It, it was uh, about uh, 80 years earlier with De Millet. So, uh, and incidentally, if you were to read through the English translation uh, Arthur Edward Waite does a great translation, the, the standard tra English translation of Dogma and Ritual and High Magic. If you were to read through that, uh, any of you who are Scottish Rite Masons and have spent any time with morals and dogma of the ancient accepted Scottish Rite will notice large um, passages that are word for word uh, morals and dogma. And I'll just say this, Morals and Dogma came out well after uh, Levy's work. And uh, I don't recall, I haven't seen in any way where uh, Levy is credited for those passages in Morals and Dogma. Yeah, we were talking about that the other day, it's called BC before copyright. <laughs> exactly, so yeah, he took some uh, large chunks in there and uh, just a lot of concepts and things. And the tarot is in fact uh, mentioned in Morals and Dogma. I'm gonna in fact read that part. I'm grabbing it off the shelf right now. It's on page 777 of the, I have a 1947 edition of Morals and Dogma. And on page 77 or 777, it says, He who desires to attain the understanding of the grand word and the possession of the great secret ought carefully to read the hermetic philosophers and will undoubtedly attain initiation as others have done. But he must take for the key of their allegories the single dogma of Hermes contained in his table of emerald and follow to class his acquis acquisitions of knowledge and direct the operation, the order indicated in the Kabbalistic alphabet of the tarot. So again, that last part, uh, he must follow the order indicated in the Kabbalistic alphabet of the tarot. So that part actually does not come to my knowledge from Levy. That's uh, Pike's own assessment. So somebody's got a mic on. And uh, so there we get Eliphas Levy, a Freemason himself, though only an entered apprentice. He didn't go beyond entered apprentice. Um, and you've got Pike uh, mentioning tarot being pretty central to the Kabbalistic alphabet of the tarot being pretty central to uh, attaining to certain mysteries as a key to certain mysteries, hermetic mysteries. And next we move on to the cipher manuscript, uh, a Trithemian cipher right there all the way to the left. Uh, Trithemius, he was uh, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's teacher and he he had a book of uh ciphers called what was it the stenographia i believe it was called stenographia and this is one of the common trithemian ciphers from the stenographia 
or graphica. And it was used by that person in the middle, Kenneth McKenzie. Now, some Freemasons uh, will recognize that name. Kenneth McKenzie uh, had the premier Masonic encyclopedia before, I want to say before Mackey's encyclopedia uh, in England, where Kenneth McKenzie was from, there was a uh, very popular series uh, of Masonic encyclopedia that he compiled. Now, Kenneth McKenzie had died. He was, a, of course, a Freemason, and he was deeply involved in the tarot. He, in fact, in the middle of the 19th century, went to Paris and had a, um, uh, an interview with Eliphas Levy, where, where they discussed matters occult for a time. I think he stayed there for a little bit, but um, he came back to England uh, sort of rejuvenated and with some other information, uh, which I and he also traveled uh, extensively around the continent for a few years because he was in Germany for a while where he is said to have attained a certain uh, Rosicrucian transmission somewhere in Germany, a, a pristine Rosicrucian transmission. He came back to England. He was a member of the Societas Rosicruciana or the Societas Rosicruciana, if you do hard C's, and uh, what we know of today as the SRIA in Anglia. And uh, he was a member of the, the society there. He also com compiled a lot of his findings in, these, in this cipher manuscript. Now, when he died, um, which was about 18, the early 1880s, let's say he died, it was right around 1883, 1885 maybe, he died. And William Wynne Westcott, the Freemason and member of the Rosicrucian uh, Society all the way to the right there, um, in his garb as the Supreme Magus of the SRIA, when Mackenzie, the guy in the middle, died, Westcott contacted his widow and said, there are very important papers among your deceased husband's documents, and uh, I need to retrieve these, here's why, et cetera, et cetera. He wasn't coming to get the cipher manuscript. He was coming to get, um, there was some other order he was trying to resuscitate, and it was something related to uh, maybe a Templar order of some kind, but uh, he and people like uh, John Yarker, collectors of rights, antiquarian types, were sort of uh, trying to compile a lot of this stuff. And um, Westcott being a Kabbalist and being steeped in the occult, even by this time, um, was very desperate to get his hands on these documents. So he went down to... Uh, maybe somewhere around Brighton. I know it was the south of England, um, some town on the shore where Mackenzie had died. And he, he went down there from London. He was the London coroner. Westcott was the London coroner. He went, he went down, he retrieved these papers, and among these papers were uh, what would come to be known as the Cipher Manuscript, which is about, I wanna say maybe 25 loose sheets of paper written in the Trithemian cipher. So it wasn't that difficult for, for Westcott to uh, figure out what this script was, what this uh, cipher alphabet was, and to start decoding things. So he enlisted the help of Samuel Little McGregor Mathers uh, to help sort of uh, codify, reorganize, and uh, ritualize the material that was in these this cipher manuscript. Now, the cipher manuscript also contained the proper, what we think of today as the proper attributions of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet to the 22 cards of the major arcana. So this is massive. In terms of the evolution of tarot um, and how we think of them today, there is no more uh, important document than the cipher manuscript. 
Now, so important was this cipher manuscript that uh, countless orders have sprung out from its uh, deciphering. And the first of which, and most notable of which, is the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a, um, a very seminal Hermetic, Kabbalistic, Victorian magical order in London formed in 1887 and 1888 is, there, is when they're what they call the outer order rituals when they were codified. So these outer order rituals are essentially contained in the cipher manuscript. So a very important document, contains all of the attributions that we know and love today. So anybody who's into Hermetic Kabbalah or Western occultism or the Western esoteric tradition, this is the, this is the narrowest part of the funnel through which this information sort of passed. You know, it was the, the most condensed and potent form of this uh, body of correspondences, astrological, Kabbalistic, Hermetic, Tarotic, magical, etc. These correspondences um, stem from the cipher manuscript. Very important. So you'll see on the left there, that is Arthur Edward Waite, who was a younger Mason. Uh, he was um, initiated 1901 at Runnymede Lodge, number 2430. Um, after he was already admitted to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. So he kind of went backwards. He did the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and then, the, uh, then he went to the Blue Lodge afterward, and then he joined the, uh, I think he joined the SRIA, Societas Rosicrucianum. So popularly, when we think of tarot today, when the, you know, the 21st century tarot user um, gets a deck of cards, they generally get a Rider Waite deck. It's the most uh, visible kind of, um, I guess, notable or popular or ubiquitous uh, deck of tarot cards today. And I'm sure everybody is familiar with those images. They were drawn and painted, uh, dr dr you know, they were ink with gouache was the, uh, the medium. And, uh, or the media, Ink and Gouache, by Pamela Coleman Smith, also a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. That's her on the right. So Arthur Edward Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith get together. They create this, um, this uh, very popular deck of tarot cards. And uh, coincidentally, or not really coincidentally, but uh, uh, Arthur Edward Waite was Ar Eliphas Levy's um, sort of uh, chief translator and commentator. So when you read works like, a, like Levy's History of Magic or his uh, Dogma and Ritual of High Magic, you are nine times out of ten going to get Arthur Edward Waite's translation with his, uh, his um, really excessive and ponderous uh, commentary. He was Try reading a little, this is just a sidebar, try reading a little Arthur Edward Waite. It's almost impossible. It's impenetrable. I mean, it's, it's uh, and, I'm, and I don't really mean that like in the good way. It's, it's just so circular and like, uh, just check it out and you'll see what I mean. It's like you could read a, a whole paragraph and be like, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. But uh, he was, um, Levy's translator and commentator, for better or worse. And uh, he designed that, that, that deck with Pamela Coleman Smith in 1909. Uh, shortly after that, in the, uh, let's say the 20s through the 50s, uh, you get Paul Foster Case there on the left. He was initiated in 1926 at Fairport Lodge in Long Island, number 476. And uh, he, he sort of riffed on the Arthur Edward Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith deck uh, in his designs. He came up with a, he was also a member of a post Golden Dawn order called Alpha et Omega, which was uh, started by Mathers. And uh, he kind of branched off from that and started his own thing. 
called the Builders of the Adidum, B-O-T-A. And uh, he designed a tarot deck where some of these correspondences are made even more conspicuous than they were in either uh, Waits or the preceding, say, Tarot de Marseille. Marseille. Uh, after him, you get Manly Palmer Hall, uh, 33rd degree Scottish Rite, Freemason, Blue Lodge Mason, initiated in 1954 at Jewel Lodge, number 374. I believe that was in San Francisco or thereabouts, the Bay Area somewhere. Uh, he and uh, Augustus Knapp also came up with a tarot deck. Now, here's what's sort of strange. Um, the attributions before the cipher manuscript that we talked about, and when I say attributions, I mean how the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet fit with those 22 cards of the major arcana, they were different before the cipher manuscript. So nobody quite knows where Mackenzie got this from. There's, there's, as, as we said, you know, he was on the continent for a while, both with Levy and, and a certain group of Rosicrucians, which may or may not have included Rudolf Steiner. And, uh, you know, a lot of people believe that because of the way it works out, because when you look at the, the, Translation of the each Hebrew letter has a certain noun associated with it. Um, when you look at those translations and you look at uh, the tarot cards and you look at the other correspondences, how the, like for instance, how they fit on the tree of life. If you're familiar with the Kabbalistic tree of life diagram, there are certain spheres or sephiroth on this tree and they are connected by certain paths. There's a line connecting each of these spheres. These spheres, not to get too deep, but these spheres are laid out in the Ptolemaic or Neoplatonic uh, planetary order, the Chaldean order of planets, where the moon is the lowest sphere, after that is Mercury, after that is Venus, and then the sun, and then Mars, and then Jupiter, and then Saturn. So there's these concentric spheres, it's the Neoplatonic cosmological model. Anyway, the, the Sephiroth on the Tree of Life are essentially in that order, and they are connected by paths. And to each of these paths, of which there are 22, to each of these paths, neatly, very cleanly, a tarot card corresponds to each of them. And it's just an amazing system. I encourage you to investigate it as much as, you, as, much as it's in your interest, you know. Um, and we, in fact, I want to bring that up here in a second anyway, but, uh, so I've shown here that since 1781 with the, um, sort of beginnings of occult tarot in, uh, De Jebeline's Le Monde Primitif, that ever since that time, that that time and every time since a Freemason has been present at every crucial juncture in the evolution of the tarot. So why is that? Why Freemasons? Uh, I guess we don't quite know, other than you may, you may be of the mind that you look at Freemasonry as being a subset of the greater Western esoteric tradition. Uh, you may look at it that, um, Freemasons have sort of a proclivity to, to unraveling symbolism or an interest in symbolism. Um, because just doesn't it seem that, uh, you know, around Freemasonry, you've gotten alchemists like, um, like, like early speculative Masons like Elias Ashmole. Okay, so we're talking the early part of the, or the middle of the 17th century, you know, uh, when Elias Ashmole approaches the fraternity, he's not an operative stonemason, he's an alchemist, a professed alchemist and astrologer. Uh, Robert Moray, I believe, was an astrologer as well, though not an alchemist. But these early, they were members of the Royal Society, a lot of, uh, and I mean, not just royalty, I mean, the Royal Society, Bacon's, kind of uh, scientific society. 
uh, of which I, I'm sure Isaac Newton was a member. It's not my strong suit, but I think these biggies like Francis Bacon and I, Isaac Newton and Elias Ashmole, they were all Royal Society um, members. And you get some of those guys in the fraternity, uh, not operative Masons. So early speculative Masonry, you get this infusion of Western esotericism. It's just around from the beginning, right? So it's peculiar. Uh, it's sort of in our symbolism of, of the craft. I mean, when we look at things like our tracing boards, when we look at the sort of strangeness of some of our ritual, um, our, certainly our central allegory. Uh, you know, there's just uh, some very peculiar, mysterious, let's say capital M, mysterious ideas about uh, about the craft. So that's kind of how, why I think that Freemasons were there uh, at, the inception, at the inception of occult tarot, kind of guiding it along, you know. Um, so you may ask yourself, uh, what is to be gained from this? Why would I even bother uh, learning about the tarot. It seems like a complicated system. This guy's talking about uh, Kabbalistic Sephiroth and, you know, all these, you know, cosmological models and how does this make sense? What does this mean to making me a better person? You know, what does this have to do with anything? Or is it just something that uh, people are interested in because the stuff looks cool? Look at that. There's like a coffin and a skull and neat looking things on there, right? So, it's, it's mysterious looking. So, and that's our tracing board. That central thing is not a tarot, you know? Those two on either side, I took those from the, uh, uh, there's a deck called the Masonic, I think it's called the Masonic Tarot. I found those online. But, uh, so you ask yourself, why? Why would I bother? I don't, I don't care about telling anybody's fortune. And, and who has the time to uh, invest in kind of uh, trying to wrap this stuff into my Masonic work. I'm just trying to become a better person, you know? Uh, and those are fair questions. And this might not be the avenue for you, but I can tell you, uh, and I will, I guess I will only speak for myself, um, which is all I can do, right? So uh, the context has been important for me, right? This is a, ubiquitous subject. We come across tarot when we talk about Freemasonry and Western esoterica. It just happens, you know, and if you're interested in Victorian magical orders, I happen to be, you know, um, then you have, you have got to know something about tarot and something about Hermetic Kabbalah and how these things fit together. They're part of one system. So if you're leaving out a chunk like that, it's, uh, it's to your detriment if you plan to make progress. In, in that arena, right? Um, tarot, they're also sort of a, uh, a Rosetta stone, right? In a lot of ways. And by this, I mean, uh, these symbols, we, we, they sort of link mythological ideas with Kabbalistic ideas, with um, alchemical imagery. And it's, when we're interested in mem memory work as Masons, right? So there's these 22 cards that are keys for us to attach uh, certain, um, they're, they're basically mnemonics, right? So that's one way you can use them. You know, building sort of a, uh, we talk about building an inner temple and we do that largely by memorization, right? Everybody knows that uh, Masonic ritual requires an extreme amount of memorization. And when we memorize things, we walk around the lodge room and we talk, and we imagine ourselves in the East, in the West, in the South. And when we're imagining ourselves doing that and we're, we're trying to pin these to certain um, memories and certain passages of ritual, we are literally creating a memory lodge or a memory temple in our minds. So this is this is akin to like an astral temple, essentially, right? And this is something that uh, Giordano Bruno talked about in his Ars Memo Memoria. This is a very common uh, Renaissance 
um, memory technique that was, uh, you know, very common to the uh, like Florentine Neoplatonists such as Facino, uh, Pico della Mirandola, and the Court de Medici, et cetera. Uh, people doing Renaissance magic. I don't know if they had tarot per se, right? But um, so the tarot is just another kind of device, another alphabet to fit into these, these greater, broader schemes in Western esoterica. So that's one other reason. Uh, here's an, I've got two other reasons why it's important to me. Um, because they provide elucidation and sort of clarity on situations when I do a tarot meditation, and I do pretty much daily, I'll take out the tarot, I'll lay out a certain spread consisting of three cards usually that have, that have to do with that particular day astrologically. Because as I said, there's correspondences to each of these cards, planetary, zodiacal, and elemental. So I'll lay out the day. So this, in, tarot, in the language of tarot, the symbolic language of tarot. And then I will look at those and I will just let those images speak to me. You know, I will just say, okay, what are these cards trying to say? So it's basically objectifying or externalizing some of these inner thought processes, right? So I'm letting, I'm, I'm trying to let a natural uh, communication and a transmission happen between me and the cards. And sometimes I'm not saying I can tell fortune, tell anybody's fortune or even my fortune, but I can get clarity. I can get elucidation. I can get a different vantage point than that which I have access to from the closed circuit of my own mind, if that makes sense. So um, instead of just, you know, this, um, this inner kind of dialogue that I'm having that, you know, by externalizing that into the tarot, it help, it airs it out, the process for me, and it helps me to sort of um, brainstorm better and to get a different vantage point from which to view any particular problem, issue, concern, question, et cetera. So that's another reason. And it takes practice doing that. That's not something that happens right away. Now, there's one other reason, um, and I'll start it off with this short story, is that uh, um, Freud, uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung had a schism over certain ideas. I think it was primarily regarding uh, sexuality in psychoanalysis. And um, Jung sort of refused to tow the Freudian party line on that stuff, and he differed with him. This upset Freud. Um, they had a schism. Jung sort of went out on his own and uh, had a crisis. He had a, it, you know, it was causing him extreme mental or psychological duress. And uh, in working out this crisis, he began to do free association or this playful imaginative thought process where he was trying to create a dialogue with his unconscious mind, whether it's his personal unconscious, and he thought it was just his personal unconscious, and that's key. But what ended up happening was he found that images began to surface that were not peculiar to him that were not uh, that were not strictly of his own symbolic language that he had developed in his personal unconscious these were broader wider uh, deeper images and they were primarily he said theological and mythological and later alchemical so these images were were coming up from a place that he posited was an area of the unconscious that all humans share, the collective unconscious. So he, through his work with imagination, he found that these mythological, theological images were, were just bubbling up from, you know, as if from some sort of deep lake just surfacing. And he encountered these and they were strange to him. They were alien to him. And, uh, 
but he had also encountered them in the work of his patients. You know, in working with his patients, he found that they also um, found, you know, a snake wrapped around a tree in a certain way. You know, apples or alchemical images or things that we associate with, uh, you know, classical myth or comparative mythology and, uh, and theological visions like um, John of Patmos, you know, the, the four living creatures or Ezekiel's Merkaba, the, the image of the chariot with uh, wheels within wheels and the four cardinal signs, et cetera. He found that these images were, were part of that collective unconscious. And I tend to, um, uh, I tend to kind of lean towards that, uh, his theory of the collective unconscious. You know, he, he said that it's, uh, it's, it, it are, it's sort of the vestigial remnants of the human psyche, right? Um, and he, he, I think an argument he made or someone else made, one of his uh, followers was uh, that just as beavers know how to make a dam on every continent, despite their not being in direct communication with each other, uh, there's something inherent in their consciousness uh, that uh, tells them that that must be done. And it is, it is also the case that we have, look, oh, here's a, here's a modern example. You ever see those videos where there's a cat and you put a cucumber or a zucchini behind the cat? If you're a cat owner, try it. When the cat's not looking, put a zucchini or a cucumber near that cat. When the cat turns around and sees that zucchini or cucumber, nine times out of 10, they will jump three to five feet in the air and, and be terrified. I mean, I'm not saying be cruel to your animal, but I am saying cats know something about that shape. Cats know something deeply, inherently about that shape. And whether it means snake or, or some other creature that they're familiar with, uh, there is something in the cat collective unconscious that is terrified of zucchinis and cucumbers. You can look it up on YouTube. Um, so that's essentially it, is that uh, the value I get out of these is, is uh, out of tarot cards and my tarot work, as so many Masons have before me, and, and so many more will after me, uh, is that uh, they're strangely communicative at a deeper level than merely the theoretical or intellectual. You know, there's something about these cards, particularly this set that I'm showing on the screen right now. This is the Tarot de Marseille. Um, I just love the images and what they say, you know, how they kind of just speak in that, in a different language, you know, the, the color symbolism, uh, the shapes of, of uh, some of the subjects there. Uh, there's just a wealth of symbolism. And isn't that what we appreciate about Freemasonry? Isn't that what we have is our priceless heritage of symbol, ritual, and allegory? That's about all I have. I'd like to open it up for a q and A. I've I've gone for about 45 minutes just now. I think that's a nice meaty presentation. If anybody has any questions, um, that'd be great. If you don't get time to ask me, uh, please reach out. I'll give you my email. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, uh, it's a passion of mine. And uh, that's all I got. Randy, thanks so much. There we go. I'm getting, of course. All right. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was awesome as always. I do have actually a couple of uh, uh, questions. The first one uh, was an observation from uh, Mike, and uh, he had a, a really cool one. It's uh, um, Lion, Ox, Man, and Eagle. He hadn't seen the references yet. You know, he's seen it, in a, uh, obviously, the... the um, uh, hippogriff or the or the Assyrian Sphinx but really hadn't put it put it together um if uh do you want to talk a little bit about uh the the four animals of the uh of the uh, uh the directions yeah 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 so there were um 
Biblically, biblically, there were uh, the four living creatures in Revelation. So that's John of Patmos, his, ap his apocalypse. Uh, he saw these four living creatures. They were the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. Um, also in Ezekiel, you'll see that he has, Ezekiel has a vision of the Merkaba, Merkaba, which is a chariot. And the chariot had wheels within wheels, he said, which kind of speaks to that astrological Neoplatonic cosmology, right? And uh, around these wheels and wheels, there was the face of a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. So again, they're occurring. And um, preceding them, there were, there were uh, guarding the, the doorways or the portals to the ziggurats of the Babylonians and probably all the way back to the Sumerians, but at least the Babylonians, probably the Akkadians as well. Uh, several Mesopotamian cultures and later the Persian uh, culture inhabiting that area, the Tigris Euphrates and thereabouts, had uh, creatures called Lamassu, L-A-M-A-S-S-U. And they were on either side of the portals of the ziggurats and ziggurats were, you know, astronomical uh, observatories, right? And so I'm bringing up these four uh, creatures, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, which you see on the world card. Um, I don't have one in front of me, but you see them on the world card uh, in the corners there. And they are the fixed, they are widely interpreted to be the fixed signs of the zodiac. So the lion, pretty obvious, that's Leo. Uh, the ox, that's Taurus, the man is Aquarius, and the eagle is Scorpio. Um, now, don't let that throw you because the eagle was anciently conflated via Aquila, the sign Aquila, or the constellation Aquila, anciently conflated with Scorpio, as was the phoenix. So, Scorpio had sort of three aspects. It had the scorpion, the eagle, and the phoenix. And that could have something to do with its 10 degree deacons, because Scorpio is third, like all zodiacal signs, Scorpio is 30 degrees out of a 360 degree circle, because there's 12 of them. Well, 10, each 10 degree segment has its own, is called a deacon or a decan, D-E-C-A-N. And uh, so that's where the conflation of the eagle and the uh, phoenix come from with Scorpio. So to cut that to one little sentence, you, you can interpret the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man as the four fixed signs of the zodiac, and you are probably correct, in do, though it's not the only interpretation. Cool. Thanks, Jamie. Um, uh, Jacob Trayer has raised his hand. Jacob, if you want to go off mute, uh, you can ask your question. Hi, Jamie. It's Jake. I'm from Ascension Lodge 89. I just so, want to know what, oh, you are. I wanted to know what your favorite uh, tarot card is. And then additionally, uh, if, if someone came up to you or if, a, if a, like a novitiate of sorts came up to you and said, hey, explain to me the three degrees of Freemasonry using three tarot cards, which ones would you choose? <laughs> wow. That is a, that is a great question. Uh, that's I, that's worth writing a paper about, right? Um, but that's a difficult one to just spring on me right now. So thanks a lot for that. <laughs> people uh, put me on Front Street in front of everybody. I know where you live. And but anyway, but uh, so my favorite tarot card, I'm going to go with the world. I just like it. I, I, I like the symmetry. I like that it has the tetramorph in it. I've done a lot of work with the tetramorph in my, my writing and my research. Uh, I appreciate that link of astrological symbolism with the, uh, the tarot, which you also find, and I'll bring up as my, my, uh, my second pick would be the star. So if you know what the star looks like, uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's associated with the astrological sign of Aquarius, and it's a woman uh, sort of pouring out two pitchers 
uh, like the aquarium, a pit, two pitchers of water, one on earth, one in the sea. And there are seven stars with a central star. And that central star has eight points, like the star of Inanna or the star of Ishtar. So I, I view that as being um, uh, Venus, or it could be Sirius maybe. And then around are seven other stars. And this is even on the Terra de Marseille. Uh, there are seven other stars, which I think of as being Palladian, you know, uh, Pleiadian, and uh, relating to the Pleiades star cl cluster. Now, the second part of your question uh, was regarding um, what degree uh, I would associate each card with. I would say judgment for the third degree, because that just immediately springs to mind. If you look at the judgment card, uh, it just has a, you know, the resonance is certainly there, I would say judgment. Um, for the second degree, um, I would say the magician uh, for the second degree, because he's working on these intellectual problems and he has his tools there and he's sort of, uh, um, the, as we know, the fellow craft degree is very intellectual. It has to, you know, training the intellect and sequencing the order of information and how we digest information and what we choose to do with that. Uh, and then for the entered apprentice, uh, why not the fool, you know? And not because an entered apprentice is foolish, but because the fool begins a journey. He seems to be beginning a cycle. He has the sack, the, the typical hobo stick with the sack on it. I think there's a name for that. I forget what it is, but he has the stick, the sack on it. His dog is, uh, sort of tearing at his pant leg and um and he's beginning his journey so the fool for the entered apprentice um the magician for the uh fellow craft because of that intellectual attainment and then the judgment card for the uh master mason wow Thanks. wow that's that's pretty wild uh brother jake do we have anything from uh the facebook group yeah we've got a couple things brother randy sorry my uh, mute button was hiding from me <laughs> um so a couple questions we've got coming in here if i can scroll to them Uh, looks like it's hidden for me. Uh, Brother Sam Lemons asked a question. Um, uh, he'd like to know uh, Brother Jamie's thoughts on the Thoth deck. Okay. Um, is he still listening? Yeah, I have uh, some thoughts on that. Uh, I had a Thoth deck and um, I gave it away recently. I gave it away probably three to six months ago. It was just because I wasn't using it. My thoughts on it are that, and this is just my personal thoughts on it, is that it is uh, too pigeonholed into a particular manner, an ideological manner. So in other words, there is a certain, um, ideology that Crowley was trying to uh, express through his reworking of the tarot, uh, reworking of um, particularly the Golden Dawn's attribution, because he was a Golden Dawn member who went rogue, sort of. Uh, not, I'm not saying I have a problem with Crowley or his teachings. I know a lot of people do, and there's some of it that I think is iffy. His lifestyle was certainly strange and unenviable. But uh, he, had did, he had done some amazing work in Hermetic Kabbalah. I do think he was a genius in that domain and that he, he did great work. But regarding the, uh, the Thoth deck, a little too conspicuously skewed to his ideology for me. So it's basically Crowley's personal deck. You know, I could see that making sense for him because he was uh, clearly uh, interested in what what we'd call today sex magic. So the, there were literally, you could see semen and menses in the images 
on those cards, you know, like the moon card, particularly. Look up the Thoth deck moon card, and you'll see that there's uh, certainly these sort of menses and semen mixing uh, in this, in what is an overt allusion to um, the menstrual cycle, the moon, and uh, sex magic as practiced by Crowley and his followers. The end. Okay, we've got a, another um, couple questions that came in. Um, is there any real mentions of Count Cagliostro's involvement or influence with the tarot? Not that I've seen. Uh, I do know that he was, I'm not sure if he was a regular Mason as we understand regular to be. I know he was Memphis Mitzrayim. I think he started the Egyptian rite of Freemasonry or, or was instrumental otherwise in that rite. I know he had uh, associated Masonically with what we would consider regular Masons, if I'm not mistaken. And he's left, um, you know, certainly a an imprint on in, in, in a huge way, if you read, uh, and I encourage you to read um, P.D. Newman's Alchemically Stoned, if you read that, he gets into um, both Melisino's and Cagliostro's uh, kind of uh, transmission into the greater Masonic current, uh, and it has to do with entheogens and the acacia. But regarding his... Uh, his tarot work, I don't even know that he did any tarot work. I'm sure he did astrological work, but I'm not, I don't know what he did with the tarot. You're on mute, Jake. Do we have another one? Oh, sorry, I started talking, I was muted. Um, Brother Travis Lawrence says, uh, do you have any opinion on the order where the strength card and Justice card have been flipped in many decks. Yes, so the Strength card and the Justice card, uh, Strength corresponding to Leo because of the lion on it, and Justice corresponding to Libra because of the scales. Um, when you switch those, the Zodiac is in order. Um, so eight and 11 had to be transposed. Uh, in order for the the order to work out zodiacally, because they're both they they both have a hermetic correspondence vis-a-vis -vis the traditionally accepted, you know, generally accepted correspondences of the West of the cipher manuscript and Western esoterica post 1887. Um, so yes, I I prefer it in the way that that they currently. That you currently find them, um, just because, uh, as I said, that's uh, they're easier to work with without having that one curveball. Now, some people have said that transpositions like those, and Crowley did one as well, where he uh, he changed the attribution of the letter Zadi um, from the star to the uh, the emperor. So he he moved Hey and Zadi and transposed those. Um, because he had gotten, that was revealed to him in Cairo in 1904, uh, some, by a, by a, you know, preternatural entity, um, which whatever, I wasn't there. I'm not sure. I, I mean, I will say this sort of off the record. I've had some entity contact, um, but, uh, but I know that that's, well, I think that that has more to do with working with my psyche than it is some objective entity out in some parallel. I don't mean to go there right now. What I'm saying is, yes, I, I, I think some of those were, uh, were blinds, what they call blinds, right? So you would, people would uh, purposefully kind of transpose things or give wrong information, uh, particularly in some of the older occult circles, but in Freemasonry, are you going to spill the beans in front of the next guy who comes along and says, I'm not, I'm interested in Freemasonry. You're not going to tell him everything. You're going to tell him probably very little, you know, only what he needs to know at that time. Right. Because that should be discovered 
at, at uh, a person's own kind of rate. And it should be commensurate to their level of penetration and their level of investigation into our work. You know, if somebody comes in and wants to do our work in the craft and, and they're not willing to develop the interpretive perspective that they need to get the most out of our work, then that's on them. There's nothing anybody, their mentor doesn't need to help them along or hold their hand. That's not what we do. If they're, if they're comfortable with the moral and ethical superficial interpretations of, say, the working tools, that rectitude of conduct, you know, squareness and upright and things like that, if they're comfortable with just those surface moral and ethical interpretations, which they are plainly given in the ritual, then, then that's fine. They don't have to go any deeper than that. And you know, but if somebody feels like developing an occult perspective or an esoteric perspective or decides to work in an astrological vantage point on our work, I can say personally that that has been very fruitful for me. I, now I forget what we were talking about. I forget where. <laughs> That's all we had out here on Facebook land, Brother Andy. Brother Ryan, you're up. What uh, what do we got uh, going on in the chat room? Uh, there goes Ryan. Uh oh, there he is. Uh, not not too much there. That that was that was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Um. I saw uh, Rudy just came in with a uh, excellent point on mentoring. Thanks, Rudy. Uh, always good to hear from you. I'd uh, love to hear you. Do you have any questions or you have any comments for us? I'll go with no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, wait, I just saw something from Vic Olson. Okay. Uh, the four creatures were also representative of the four tribes of Israel. Uh, why doesn't the ox have a halo? Um, so yeah, and and I and I know Vic to be a, a member of the uh, the chapter, the council, and the consistory of Phoenix York right bodies, uh, as was I at one point. And um, in fact. Uh, Vic was there when I when I went through, and those uh, banners did indeed strike me as well. Those of let's see if I could remember Ephraim, Reuben, Dan, and Judah, right? And uh, Judah, as you would imagine, is the lion. Uh, Ephraim, I think, is the man. Well, the rest of them are the the lion, the man, the ox, and the eagle. So they again, there were twelve tribes looked at zodiacally, which the aforementioned Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, who we were talking about during my presentation, uh, a, a seminal sort of founding member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He was also Societus Rosicruciana and a Blue Lodge Mason in England. He, uh, he did a paper on the 12 tribes of Israel and their zodiacal correspondences in the uh, mid 1880s. And um, in that, you can, you can find that the four tribes of which we see the banners and, in, in the tabernacle, if I remember correctly, um, they were, so the, they could be looked at as being zodiacal as well. Okay, cool. Thank you, Brother Ryan. Thank you, Brother Jamie. Thank you, Brother Jake. Um, do we have any other questions or any comments? You knocked it out of the park. I got to tell you, I, I am the luckiest person in the world to be able to uh, work with uh, uh, Michael and Ryan here to uh, bring this kind of content. Jamie, thank you again for, for your, all of your time and, and work on this. It's always a pleasure, and it's the least I can do, particularly in these times when we're when we're really needing this, you know, this sort of thing. D talk to me a minute about your uh, book, your new book. All right. So June twenty fourth, twenty twenty, which is Saint John the Baptist Day, 
Uh, it's also a Wednesday, and Wednesday is uh, Wednos or Mercury or Hermes. So it's, it's the perfect hermetic day to put it out, and it's the perfect sort of solstitial, uh, Johannine kind of Masonic day to put something out as well. So on St. John's the Be Wednesday, St. John the Baptist Day, I'm releasing my second book, which is entitled uh, Approaching the Middle Chamber, the seven, Liber that's the title, Approaching the Middle Chamber, subtitle, The Seven Liberal Arts in Freemasonry and the Western Esoteric Tradition. I know it's a mouthful, but I kind of wanted to, wanted to have that. So Approaching the Middle Chamber, The Seven Liberal Arts in Freemasonry and the Western Esoteric Tradition. So it has to do with uh, exactly what the title says. And uh, I go, I do the fellow craft lecture from the very beginning on the porch all the way to the end, to the middle chamber. And I minutely go through all of those points. Um, I minutely go through all of those points from the perspective of uh, Western esotericism. So, uh, and from just Western civilization, because I deal with a lot of pre-Socratic philosophy, uh, classical philosophy, alchemy, um, the, the Alexandrian milieu of mystery traditions, so Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, early Christianity, uh, and uh, certainly early astrological traditions like you find in Samaria, Acadia, uh, Babylon, the, the Sabians of Haran, um, and I go from all these, the magical perspective as well, like through the medieval grimoire tradition, through the Solomonic grimoire tradition, uh, like the uh, Claviculi Solomonis um, Regnum, I believe is what it is in, in Latin, but the greater key of Solomon, Goetic magic, uh, and I zero in on our subjects from all of those perspectives. So if you're interested at all in general Masonic esoterica um, or the esoteric or occult kind of view of, of some of our work, and I take it very seriously. There's no like um, fluff in there. I cite all of my sources from source documents. Uh, I go back literally thousands of years in my citations and um, and I, I go to source material as often as humanly possible when it is extant. And uh, there, are, there are almost as many citations in that book as there is text. And it's going to be about a 400-page book. So, uh, wow. Yeah. It, it, well, it is. It's done, right? It's just got to be formatted. And that's why I'm charging um, $600. Per, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's going to be, uh, it's, I, it's probably going to be like, $25 per book, but you've got to get it. it I, all right, and I'm going to say this since I've got the floor for a second. I think, I'm going to say it, I think it's one of the most important books for a fellow craft to have out of anything, and it's fellow craft safe, right? Because I wrote it for that lecture. I don't go into anything really beyond that very conspicuously to where it would ruin anything for anybody, but uh if you're a fellow craft and you don't have that book, um, you need that book. Somebody needs to get you. It should be canonical. You'll see. You'll see once it's out. You're going to read it and you're going to be like, oh, my God, how did I not have this? I hope that's what happens anyway. I'm talking it up, but it's my baby. So Nice. Yeah. No, this is good. This is excellent. Thank you for sharing. That's uh, something that uh, on the last presentation I had uh, hoped to uh, – get you to talk a little bit about and, and uh, uh, didn't get a chance to. So thank you. It's going to be massive. It's, I mean, it's a game changer. Seriously. I mean, I've read a lot of Masonic books. It's a game changer. Right, Jake? Jake did a proofread of it. Jake, Jake Trey. Am I right? It's pretty good. It's probably what? the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> No, it's uh, I agree with Jamie. It's uh, someone, someone, one of the other guys who who helped said it was a a college course on the second degree, and I think that's a perfect explanation. I think that's hey, like, tell him who said that. Pierce Vaughn said that. Pierce Vaughn. 
Yeah, I couldn't remember which one it which one it was, but uh, Chris college course on the forward to the book. It's an amazing book. Literally, every Mason should should get it as soon as it comes out. So, and then uh, and uh, you have a podcast too. Oh yeah, Jake and I started a podcast, and we we can't tell people right now because it's not the website isn't complete yet. But I'll I'll spill the beans on that very shortly. Excellent. Excellent. You, you heard it here first. That's awesome. Right. Um, Brother Ryan, uh, do we have any announcements? Uh, just if you want to announce our, our tentative schedule coming up, you know, we, we're going to be doing this every week. We're going to continue to bring you guys some excellent Masonic education from excellent Masonic presenters. Uh, do you want to roll out our tentative schedule? Uh, just offhand, let's see, I'm looking at the calendar now, and uh, next week we'll have uh, Brother Greg Kaminsky, uh, a Cult of Personality podcast, um, excellent speaker. Uh, on the 15th, uh, Brother Chuck Dunning, who on a uh, unfortunately competing uh, simulcast tonight because we had so much going on did a phenomenal job and knocked it out of the park on a uh, uh, presentation on the four virtues. And then um, I'm going to leave it at that for now. I'm going to brag on uh, Brother Jake Thompson. And I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the, the brother's name. Give me just a moment. Uh, and I'll be darned. Brother Ryan, help me out. Who's, uh, uh, who's uh, Mike Longo? Mike Longo, thank you, thank you, thank you. Brother Longo, I apologize. Uh, I had it written down and apparently not on this piece of paper. Um, so Brother Longo and uh, Brother Jake Thompson will be doing uh, a back-to-back -back education on the 22nd. And then uh, our very own uh, uh, Brother Jarzebek will be doing the 29th. That's what it's looking like right now. Now we may need to shift one or two of those around depending on when that panel uh, can come in because that is so topical and so um, uh, direct into what we're uh, um, experiencing now with uh, the world around us. But the reality is that's we've got April uh, pretty well sewn up um, and uh, uh, already looking into May. So that's all I have. Anybody else have anything? I'd like Thanks, to thank guys. everyone. Who joined us tonight? I was going to say thank you very much. It was really, really good, and I never, I never thought in a million years uh, connecting the tarot, the Masonic, the everything. You know, it was very interesting. I was tied together. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, brethren. Thanks for your attention. And uh, again, get my email, maybe from Randy or off of my, uh, uh, or get me on Facebook if you want to talk about it, anything further. Thank you, brother. Thank you, folks. Uh, have a great evening, and uh, we'll see you back here in a week. Same bat time and same bat channel. Take Thank care. You. Thanks, everyone.